Hey, my name is Drew Boa. I'm the founder of Husband Material, where I help men outgrow porn. Today's episode is a sermon that I delivered at the recent Husband Material retreat in Santa Barbara. You are about to hear or watch the original recording of my sermon on Psalm 133, The Beauty of Brotherhood. If you didn't get to attend the retreat, and maybe you really wanted to, or you feel left out because you weren't able to make it, this sermon is my gift to you. And I hope it's a blessing. If you did get to attend the retreat, this sermon is also my gift to you, especially as you are experiencing the loss of what we shared together. Regardless, in preparation for this message, I read Psalm 133 over and over again. I researched it. I burned it into my brain. I digested it and I let it fully sink into me so that I could overflow and share it with you. As you listen, may the word of God do the work of God in your heart so that every time you read this psalm, you remember the beauty of brotherhood. Enjoy the message. Today we're talking about the beauty of brotherhood. And it occurs to me that many of us have sexualized brotherhood. Our sins, they are many. And his mercy is more. And he, what, what kindness he has lavished on us to give us brotherhood, no matter what we've done with it in the past. <laughs> wow. He is refathering us this weekend through one another. And this psalm capitalizes on that. Maybe more than any other place in the Bible, God is really into this thing called Dwelling together in unity. Amen. Something that brothers do. Um, I want to read, I want to read this psalm again. Um, I'm gonna read you the inverted version that I wrote. <laughs> it's the DBV, Drew Bow version. <laughs> And at the end, you will hear the gospel according to Psalm 133, also in the DBV. I'm going to read this in the NIV 1984. That's, that's my favorite. So it's going to be a little different than what you have in your order of worship. That's okay. Psalm 133, a song of ascents of David. How good and pleasant it is when brothers live together in unity, it is like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down upon the collar of his robes. It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion, for there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. And now, Psalm 133, inverted. Alas, how devastating it is when brothers divide and isolate. It is like the misery of Jacob running away from his brother, running from his brother Esau, running away from the rage on his face. It is like the harsh, empty desert where rain never falls. For there, the enemy has triumphed. Life is cut off. And the reality is many of us have grown up in the harsh, empty desert where life is cut off. We have spent years, maybe decades, without experiencing this beautiful brotherhood, and it has been devastating. But we don't really even know it, if that's all we've ever had. So, this is a loaded topic. And, and into our harsh, empty desert, some of us have pursued brotherhood, some of us have avoided brotherhood. We're running away from it. Maybe we've been wounded like Jacob by his brother Esau. He was terrified of Esau. He ran far, far away. And eventually, 
when Jacob and Esau met, again, after many years of being apart, they hugged, they kissed, they wept. It's like a little foreshadowing of the prodigal son coming home. How good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity. So precious, so powerful. So today, you're going to hear about what God says about this brotherhood thing. First thing you need to know about Psalm 133 is that it is a song of ascents. There are a few psalms in the 150, right in that 133 range, which are called songs of ascent. These are songs. They're not just poems. Like, they would sing this as they were traveling to their annual gatherings in Jerusalem. So how appropriate here at our annual gathering for us to be reflecting on these words. You could imagine men of Israel and Judea not having seen each other for months, maybe years, being so excited to come to the festival to worship, knowing that they would see each other, that they would see each other's families, and, and they would have this, this time where, where for a brief period, they're living together, not apart. How sweet that must have been. How much they, mu- they must have looked forward to this. You can imagine them singing these words, how good and pleasant it is, how delightful it is for us to be together, even if it's for this little amount of time, even if it's brief even if they're few and far between. We've got to treasure it. <laughs> so it's a song of a sense. That's, that's how this came into being. Friends, families that live far away from each other coming together because of God. It says how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. Um, I like the one that I read earlier that says when brothers live together in unity. For some of you, that might be a surprise. What do you mean living together with brothers? Is that a thing? It was back then. There's a much more communal culture. We live in one of the most isolated, individualistic times ever. One of the most isolated, individualistic places. Uh, We don't do this thing called living together. So this might feel a little different for us to be living together for a few days. I heard someone say yesterday, I've never experienced anything like this before, what we're doing this weekend. He said, it's like learning a new language. Wow. If this language of brotherhood was not spoken in your home, or if it was, if it was corrupted, or if it it never really fully felt good and pleasant, then this is like learning a new language. And it's going to take time, and it's going to be awkward, and that's okay, and it's kind of scary, and we mess it up sometimes, and, and it's still so good. It's so good and pleasant. So I'm going to call this thing, this new language, embodied brotherhood. Psalm 133 is about embodied brotherhood. That's what we get to experience today. A lot of times we experience online brotherhood, and that's okay. But that's not what God is crazy about. Am I the only one who thinks the psalmist is a little bit too excited about brotherhood? It is, it is like precious oil running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of his robes. It's like a slow-mo capture of the oil dripping down his beard. It's like, it's like okay, I get it. <laughs> you know, But God is really into this thing. And David was really into this thing, embodied brotherhood. And you see it in his relationship with Jonathan. They were really, really close. And that wasn't weird. That was actually kind of normal. They had a covenant as brothers. They were committed to each other. They went through hell together. And and they stuck together to the very end, even though they had so many reasons to divide and isolate. And I want to validate that Sometimes we need to divide and isolate, and it's so painful. Sometimes it has to happen. We need to separate ourselves, or somebody else separates, and that sucks. It really sucks. 
and how much sweeter is it when, when it is actually happening the way God intended? Or when we get to repair a relationship that was broken. So sweet. So that's the first thing we see is that embodied brotherhood is precious. It is rare, especially if you've never had it. He says it is like precious oil. And specifically, not just oil, um, this, this image of olive oil, anointing oil, is very specific. In fact, God says a few things about embodied brotherhood in, in this psalm, and I would summarize it this way. Embodied brotherhood is awesome. It is precious and rare. It is powerful and life-giving. And it is eternal. So let's start with verse 1. Looking at this idea of precious anointing oil. What's going on there? So when Aaron, the very first high priest, was anointed and dedicated for this role as priest, they, they anointed him. So the oil would come from outside of him. Somebody else would pour it on him, start on his head, and then it goes down to his beard, and then it goes down to the collar of his robes, and then it goes down to the lower part of his robes, and it, it flows all the way down. I mean, if you're reading this, you see the word down three times. That is emphatically repeated. Running down on the beard. Down on the beard of Aaron. Down on the collar of his robes. What's with that? Why is he making such a big point about this, this thing coming down? I'm going to quote Tim Challies for an explanation. In the same way that oil spread from Aaron's head to his beard to his clothing, unity was to flow from God to the priest to the people. It's saying that brotherhood, unity, fellowship, when it's real, comes from God. Amen. It doesn't start with us. It's not something we create. We just get to receive it and experience it. It's coming down. It starts with God, who exists eternally in perfect relationship, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that party has been going on forever. And then he chooses to come down in Jesus Christ, our high priest. It says, God poured out his spirit on the great and final high priest, Jesus Christ, who is the head of the church. Like oil flows from hair to beard to collar, the spirit flows from head to body, from Christ to church. So here's that picture of unity coming down. It starts with God being eternally in perfect love and joy. If you can imagine some of the playful relationships that, that are growing here this weekend, God has always had that. And it's so awesome that he wants to share it. And it overflows into him creating the world. And then he comes down into the world as our high priest, Jesus, the one who is creating this brotherhood that we now share. So it starts with God, comes through Jesus. The spirit comes down on him when he's baptized and says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. You've probably heard that before. Now, what Jesus enjoys, he now shares with us, his brothers. So we get to have that because of him. Beloved sonship, brotherhood. That's what we were created for. And Jesus makes it possible. So when you read that about the oil, you can see how eventually that leads us to Jesus. And from Jesus, from the head, it flows down to the rest of the body. And that's us, the body of Christ. How cool is that? I want to make it a little more practical. Now, that's a nice, beautiful idea. Now, let's get real. This weekend, God has been present. 
He has been present to us, and He has been present through us. Amen. We, as the body of Christ, are called a priesthood. So Jesus is the high priest, and all of us, we're a priesthood of believers. Amen. And you know what the priest's job is? It's to represent God. <laughs> we have been representing God to each other. Amen. At least that's our job, that's our role, and we're not going to do it perfectly. Could it be... Could it be that in every kind word and in every welcoming smile and in every great big bear hug you've received this weekend, God has been giving you a kind word. God has been giving you his welcoming smile. Could it be that God has been giving you a great big bear hug through your brothers? It comes from him. That's what the psalm is saying. It's saying unity comes from God. If you experienced unity and connection this weekend, thank God. Because he's the one who's given it to you. Whether you like it or not. (laughs) If I skip ahead to the end of the psalm, it says the Lord has commanded the blessing. He bestows the blessing. This is a blessing. It's a gift. You can't earn it. You can't perform for it. You can't be good enough for it. In fact, if you try to do that, you're actually going to prevent yourself from receiving it. Amen. You just got to receive it. Right. And so we're trying to do that this weekend. We're learning how to be loved. And to learn how to be loved by God, we are learning how to be loved by one another. Amen. Learning how to love one another. So that's the idea of priesthood. God is being, God is present here. And he is present To us, through us. Could it be that God has chosen to hug someone else through you? Could it be that you have been a priest to someone else and just your simple presence of sitting with that man, of praying together, of crying together, of just listening to his story, was the Holy Spirit in you showing you that you really do matter that you really are significant, that no matter what you've done and no matter how many your sins are, they cannot prevent you from being a brother and a priest and a lover who who is embodying the presence of God in this world. And I hope that that serves as evidence to you that you're not too broken, that you're not too far gone that no, no matter how long it's taken you this far, it's never too late. And just as God has chosen to be present through you, he is also present to you. Amen. Even when we don't realize it. Right. You know what Jacob said? After he ran away from Esau and he was about to meet his brother, he had this experience of wrestling with God. Wasn't wearing any socks. <laughs> But he did get hurt. And he was wrestling with God. And, and, it, and, and this experience gives him a new name. And it prepares him to meet his brother. And along the way, he says, Surely the Lord was in this place, and I did not know it. Yeah. Isn't that the anthem of this weekend? Yes. Surely the Lord is in this place. And we did not know it. Or we didn't know all the little details, the ways that he was present. Because we just think... Oh, I had a great conversation with this guy. I'm not thinking, I just had an encounter with God. But that's what was happening. Because the Holy Spirit's here. Because he's, he's working through us. And he's, he's pursuing us. Could it be that God is doing something? I think so. Whether we like it or not. <laughs> now, embodied brotherhood is precious. Why is it precious? Why is it so amazing? Because it's powerful. It's life-giving. And that's what the second image teaches us. The first image in in verse 1 and 2 is the image of the anointing oil. This is a very special thing. This is a sacred thing. Now we get into verse 3, and it starts talking about Hermon. If you're wondering who Hermon is, he's a mountain. Hermon is not a person. (laughs) Hermon is Mount Hermon. And, and I want to tell you a little bit about that 
because if you don't know what Mount Hermon is, it doesn't make sense. I had a chance to, to visit the Holy Land, and when I did, I was struck by the geography of it. If you go to Jerusalem, it's dry, it's rocky. If you go to another part of it, it's a big flat desert. If you go to another part of it, it's kind of green where Jesus grew up. Meadows and a lake. Then you go further north, and there's snow. What? There's snow? Yeah, on Mount Hermon. Mount Hermon is on the northernmost border. It's on the border of Lebanon and Syria, and it's over 9,000 feet in elevation. It's got snow, even year-round up there. Now, you contrast that with the mountains of Zion that are also spoken about, and it's a stark contrast. I mean, the mountains of Zion are really just hills. They're not really mountains, which some people have said Santa Barbara is not really mountains, it's just hills. Well, the mountains of Zion are really hills. It's hill country. Mount Hermon's a real mountain, and it has a different geography, and that means it has a different water system. So notice what it says about the dew of Hermon. When I think the dew of Hermon, I'm like thinking about a sweaty guy named Hermon. He's got this <laughs> dew on him. That's not the image here. <laughs> You're like, why is that beautiful? <laughs> the dew of Hermon is the unique dew that, that falls in the morning in a place where there's lots of water. It's pretty simple. Of course, the mountain is beautiful. Now, let me read verse 3 from my translation that I like. It says, It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion. To imagine that all the water from the snow-capped peaks could come into the desert. Wouldn't that be amazing? Wouldn't that be so life-giving? Wouldn't that be powerful? That's brotherhood. That's this weekend. In the middle of your desert, you're in the snow-capped peaks of abundance. That's what they got to experience at their annual festivals when they got together. That's what we get a glimpse of. And I have to confess something. I have to confess that this is a weekend of abundance for me. Many of you remember on Friday night when I got in the middle of our group and I said, what I deeply desire is friendship. Because embodied brotherhood is not something that I have where I live. I have a little bit of it, but I've actually been avoiding it. I haven't been prioritizing it. And it's felt dry and lonely. So some of you guys have been asking me, Drew, how are you doing? What's going on with you? And I'm telling you guys, I'm having such a great time, and I am going to be so sad when this is over. Because <laughs> I'm going back to the desert. Maybe some of you are in a similar place. You're going back to the desert after this. So, I'm savoring it. This is precious. This is sacred. And I feel God, t God telling me to just receive. Just receive this. And rejoice in the one who gave it to me. Rejoice in the Christ who died so we could have this. Did you know that right before Jesus went to the cross, he prayed that his disciples would be one. That we would be as unified as he is with the Father. That was his prayer that he shared with all his disciples right before he went to the cross. He prayed it, and then he made it happen. In Ephesians it says he destroyed the dividing wall of hostility. He has broken down every single barrier for us to have brotherhood. And and so, because of that, I want to remind you that Jesus 
has paid the ultimate price so that we could reap this ultimate reward. And I feel so convicted that, that I'm making this embodied brotherhood thing peripheral in my life. Like, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll do work, I'll do family, I'll do self-care, but brotherhood, I don't really have space for that except through my phone and my computer. I'm personally feeling very convicted this weekend that I'm neglecting this beautiful, amazing blessing that Jesus died for me to have. How about you? Have you been prioritizing embodied brotherhood? Or has it been an optional add-on? We have a really, really difficult time developing this brotherhood. It's not easy. It's like learning a new language. And yet, our God, our Father, wants nothing more than for His sons to get along, to come back to Him, and to come back to each other. For those of you who are fathers, what's it like for you when you see your kids enjoying one another? What's it like when you see them helping each other out? When you see them connecting, you didn't plan it. You didn't make it happen. They're just doing it. Doesn't it make your heart full? That's how God feels about his sons getting together for beauty and brotherhood. He loves it. He's dwelling on it. He can't get enough of it. And that's why enjoying embodied brotherhood is so important. It is precious. It is rare. It is life-giving. And for all those reasons, it is eternal. Let this sink in. The relationships that you have with your brothers in Christ past, present, and future, will last forever. Forever! Jesus died and rose from the dead to create heaven on earth. And we get a little glimpse of that glory here. We get a little foretaste of the future. And it gives me hope when I'm in the desert that abundance is coming that forever we will live together. We will. With our brothers and with our sisters. They're not here with us right now. They're a big part of this too. And I know it's sometimes difficult to relate to them. And sometimes they hurt us and sometimes we hurt them. In the end, there will be perfect unity. And in fact, this morning I realized there will only be brother and sister relationships. Our parents will be our brothers and sisters in this eternal glory. Our kids will be our brothers and sisters. We will all be brothers and sisters. And God loves it. He created it. It was his idea. He died for it. Jesus died on the cross to destroy division and isolation and to bring about embodied brotherhood and sisterhood. He is answering his own prayer request for life on earth to be the same as life in heaven. He's already done everything necessary to make it possible. He's paid for the penalty. He is now working through his spirit here and through his power. He's he's creating and cultivating that brotherhood. And one day, it will be impossible to sin. And if what I'm reading in the Bible is true, we will be together forever. That's how this psalm ends. It says, For there the Lord bestows his blessing... 
life forevermore. And at first I thought, is it talking about Mount Zion? Because it says, it is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion, for there the Lord bestows his blessing. No, no, no. He's going back to the very beginning. For when brothers live together in unity, that's where God bestows his blessing. Life forevermore. It's not in a specific location. Maybe some of you guys need to hear that. God's blessing is not on this location and this event and this particular circumstance this weekend. It is on the embodied brotherhood. Wherever and whenever it happens, that's where God has bestowed his blessing. That's what we get to enjoy forever. What a gift. A blessing, not a burden. Not something to earn. Not something to anxiously agonize over. Something to receive from Jesus, because it all comes from Him. I invite you to respond to the Word of God in three ways. Because God is really into this stuff. He's more excited about it than we are. So get used to it. It's going to last forever. Amen. You better get used to the fact that you're going to be close to men forever. And you better get used to the fact that you're going to be close to women forever. And it's going to be earth as it is in heaven. And we get to lean into that and pursue that here in three ways. Number one, rejoice. Rejoice in our true older brother, our very best friend, Jesus Christ. Amen. He is the friend closer than a brother. All the brotherhood here it is actually second best. The best brotherhood is with Jesus. And I need to remind myself of that too. He is the precious one. He is the rare one. There's only one. It's him. He is the powerful one. He is the life-giving one. The best brotherhood you will ever experience is with Jesus Christ. So rejoice in that. Also, as we move into the next part of the service, I invite you to receive brotherhood. You may want to pray with a prayer minister or pray with a friend after taking communion. We'll have prayer ministers all around the sides and the back. And of course, you can grab anyone. And just be. Just be. Instead of running away. There are a few reasons we run away from brotherhood. In my opinion, they're the same reasons that we sometimes sexualize brotherhood or that we sometimes turn to other sexual behaviors or sexualize women. I think the core, the core reasons why we run away from God and each other are fear, shame, and loss. I think that's, that's the core. Is there something you're afraid of that you're running from? Or a, a reason why you're afraid of, of brotherhood? Is there shame that you carry that could keep you from brotherhood? Is there loss? Maybe, maybe you had brotherhood. Maybe you have had it, but you lost it. It's so, so agonizing. I, I hate it. I experienced that over and over again, moving from place to place. The friendships I was making get cut off, and they're never the same after that. Maybe you've lost brotherhood. And so there's, there's a hesitancy because you don't want to have something that you could lose again. So engage your shame, engage your fear, engage your loss, and receive real brotherhood. Instead of fear, receive safety. Find safety. Instead of shame, receive glory. 
instead of loss, receive connection. Just receive it. You might also want to journal. You might want to write a note to someone and share it with another man during this extended time. I encourage you to stay sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And if you're not sure how to do that, listen to your gut. Trust your gut for what's most important for you, whether that's journaling, writing a note, receiving prayer, just worshiping with the music that's going to be played. Rejoice in Christ. Receive what you might be running away from. And reflect. Where do you have brotherhood in your life? Maybe you have more of it than you might think. Enjoy that. Practice gratitude. In your journaling, name it. And also, where do you lack unity? Not only in the longing for relationships, but in conflict. What if there's something that's coming between you and another man at this retreat and you haven't said anything about it? And there's something that was bothering you. Without attacking or withdrawing, it's okay to say, hey, there's a part of me that was feeling something at this time earlier this weekend, and I want to talk to you about it because I care about you, because I believe brotherhood is precious and powerful and important and eternal, and I don't want anything to get between us. That could be a courageous, redemptive risk that you might want to take to engage conflict. And if you're not ready to do that, that's okay. That's okay. You might also want to get prayer. Rejoice, receive, reflect, and hear the gospel of 133. Sorry. And hear the gospel of Psalm 133, Drew Boa version. Behold, how good and pleasant it is to have embodied brotherhood with Jesus. It is so precious to know him. It is so powerful to be with him. For here, together, as brothers in Christ, the Lord bestows his blessing. Life forevermore. Let's pray. God, I just want to take a moment to breathe. Come, Holy Spirit. Oh, God, reinforce your redemption this morning. Delight in us. Open us up to receive your delight, your joy, your smile at brotherhood. I even grieve for the lack of brotherhood that people might be experiencing right now. I grieve for the lack of connection that some have felt. In fact, I grieve for all of us because all of us need more brotherhood than we have. Thank you for providing it. Thank you for, for your commitment to create this community in Christ that we get to enjoy and receive from you. You are such a good father to give us these brothers. Make us even more Christ-like toward one another and towards women and towards our sisters in Christ so that we can get ready for forever, so that we can get used to this reality. Lead us, Lord. Lead us, Holy Spirit. Lead us into all truth. Give us a sense in our gut of what we need right now and continue the work that you have begun this weekend. Amen. Hey man, thank you so much for listening. I hope to see you at a future Husband Material retreat. And always remember that you are God's beloved son, and in you, he is well pleased.